This is The Catholic Current with Father Robert Mateig. I've told couples, too, who are not living together but are also not chaste, said, what you're saying to your future spouse is, look at me, I can't be trusted. Look at me, I'm willing to defy Christ. Now pledge yourself to me, body and soul. That's drilling holes in the bottom of the boat before it launches, isn't it? Yes, it is. You know, the only secure way of being close to God is by avoiding sin and living virtue. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus. You're really host of the Catholic Current. We're bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment, that hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, friends, you know, Matt Walsh is making a lot of headlines these days with his documentary called What is a Woman? And there's a famous clip where he, he's talking to someone who's educated and influential. And Matt mentions the word truth, and the person breaks off the interview and says, truth is offensive. Well, we need to talk about that, and we have an important book to talk to help us begin that conversation. The new book is called uh, Sanctify Them in Truth, How the Church's Social Doctrine Addresses the Issues of Our Time. I have the author with us now. He's pastor of Our Lady of Grace Parish in Indian Land, South Carolina, and he's adjunct professor of theology at Belmont Abbey College. Father Jeffrey Kirby, welcome to The Catholic Current. Thank you, Father. It's good to be on the show. Father, I admired your, your book for its clarity and for its orthodoxy, and I, I think it fills a great need. There is so many misunderstanding of what the Church's social teaching is, and I want to talk about two in particular. One is is that as long as you're helping out at a, at a soup kitchen, it doesn't matter what you do with the rest of your moral life. And the other is that the only authentic Catholic approach to anything is more free stuff for everyone to infinity, and we don't have to pay for it if the government gives it to us. Both of those are delusional. Neither of those are authentically Catholic. Yet I've heard them very often in Catholic circles. How would you begin to correct those errors? Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, as Christians, we have to understand that everything we do, so our entire way of life, is done in Christ. So St. Paul loved that expression, in Christ. So everything we do flows from our desire to continue the work of the Lord Jesus, to dwell with Him. So everything has to be ordered according to the Lord's teachings and the definitive interpretation given to those teachings by the Church's shepherds. So I think that as we approach our, our understanding of the Christian way of life, we have orthodoxy, so this is a, a right worship as well as right doctrine, and everything has to flow from that, and what we usually speak of in terms of orthopraxy, which means everything has to flow from right doctrine, right worship, so we have right action. So if we're going to help with the soup kitchen, that's wonderful. We're called to do that as Christians, but that should be an extension of what we seek to do in Christ. So the idea that we're going to do a corporate work of mercy, therefore it doesn't matter what I believe, or even how I interpret what I'm doing. Why am I helping a soup kitchen? Is this an act of philanthropy or condescension, or is this really an extension of the work of Christ? a desire to share the love of the Father with all men and women. So I think that our, our doctrine has to influence how we approach these social issues of our day. And, and that, by the way, is the social doctrine. We speak of social doctrine, and the term is, is new to a lot of Catholics. So like, what, what are you talking about? It's the application in the social order to the social issues. It's the application of our doctrinal teachings, orthopraxy to ortho orthodoxy to orthopraxy. So right doctrine, right worship to right action. So it all comes together. It's all part of the way of the Lord Jesus. You know, I think that, you know, this reminds me of things I used to teach students, you know, you know, pull on the thread, you get the whole rug. Uh, so if you're going to talk about Christ, you have to talk about worship. You have to talk about 
love when you have to talk about morals. Uh, they are they are as as one. You, you can't mention one dimension without mentioning the other. Friends, we're talking about truth in a culture of lies. My guest today is Father Jeffrey Kirby. We're talking about his his new and very useful book called Sanctify Them in Truth, How the Church's Social Doctrine Addresses the Issues of Our Time. I liked your very clear methodology as well. Because you, in each chapter, you always know what to expect. You, you, you don't get lost. And you talk, for each uh, social issue you address, you talk about building a foundation, taking our stand, and going to the mountain. Can you walk us through that methodology, please? Yes, the, the beginning of each chapter, as you described, is really just getting ready. And, and what I want to do, what I wanted to do in, in, at the beginning of each chapter, was to present a virtue or a principle from our social doctrine. Because I, I make the point that if we don't have an understanding of our own virtue, or our own principles, then we begin to think and argue as unbelievers. We use principles from secularism in order to make moral arguments. But but as Christians, we, we have the most excellent way of love. We, we have a higher order that's been given to us. So at the very beginning, I just say, here are some virtues. Here are some principles from our social doctrine. And, and again, it, it's laying the foundation. It's getting things ready. That these are important parts of our Christian way of life that's going to help us to address every issue, but then the specific issue of the respective chapter. So that's, that's the first part. And then the second part is is actually going through the you know, the arguments. So why does the church teach it? Uh, what is the rationale behind it? Uh, what are some challenges that, that we've heard against the church's teachings? How can we respond to those? So that's really the, the heart of the teaching. So the catechesis is that middle part. And then the last part, going to the mountain. Yeah, I wanted to make the point that you know, as we said earlier, that you know the the orthopraxy that that right action has to reflect that that right worship, that right doctrine. So, I want to conclude with the spiritual response. So, here are some prayers. Here are some uh, meditative practices in our tradition. Uh, here are some things that can help us spiritually, because you know we're not promoters of an ideology. We're not pu- pushing some political platform. We are Christians who are seeking to share the way of the Lord Jesus with every man and woman. And we have to make sure that we go back to the font of grace, we go back to prayer, and we remind ourselves why we're doing this, that we seek to speak the truth in love, that we have to keep our own humility, you know, not allowing our defensiveness or our anger or our hurt to get in the way of our desire to share the life-saving truth of Jesus Christ. So that last part is significant to each chapter because it just reminds us of the spiritual reality, the higher order that's been given to us. See, I, I think that that's so important. I've said on the air several times, and I imagine you've heard this, Father, too, and it's it's only partially a caricature during the prayers of the faithful at Mass. You know, O oh Lord, now that we've identified another human need, in thy mercy, raise up a mighty federal program. Uh, and so that the, the solution to everything is... Uh, and I think you've identified this correctly. The, the idea is that we've got Christians reasoning and acting as as not Christians, as if Christ and his revelation of himself and his will and his wisdom is is irrelevant. As we you know, as we look about the, the genuine human needs of the world and we put that in the context of Christ's mission, how do we get hands on as Christians without losing sight of our higher frame of reference? Yeah, so so oftentimes as a pastor, I recommend to the members of my parish, to, to every Christian believer, that they start writing their own families. So to go through the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, like you know, who might need uh, extra help with food or uh, extra time for, for consolation or whatever it might be, but to, to look at their own families and then their extended families. So you know, is there is an uncle or a grandparent or a cousin that, that needs help? Because you know, we start there. What, what what is the immediate need of my family? St. Paul tells us that every family receives his name from God. The heavens have named our families. We are together for a specific reason. So I think that, you know, as Christians, we start there. That's our first mission territory, we could say. And then by extension, I encourage people, look at your neighborhoods. As you were saying, Father, we always go to the government, and we think some program has to be the solution. Those can be a help. You know, and our principles of subsidiarity, so the different levels of, of how we live and, and handle issues, uh, you know, there, there can be a place for that. 
But as Christians, we should understand our families are our first mission territory, and then our neighborhoods. If I know that there's a widow across the street who might need help with groceries, then I'm called as a Christian to go and provide that help (laughs) as best I can. Not to say, oh, well, she needs to go to the county office or she needs to pursue a government program. And that might be part of it, depending on the need. But first and foremost, the Christian response is my hands, my heart, myself, I go and I have to be the instrument of God's love to this person. So I think our families, our neighborhoods, places of work, our extended network of friends. So oftentimes, I say this in the parish, like people will come and say, Father, we have to start this program. We need to do this. Okay, but that's a good point. But how are you doing that in your family and in your neighborhood? Wow. Because we run the risk of running programs from institutions, but right. the Christian believer never actually goes across the street to their neighbor or to the member of their extended family in order to fulfill the gospel mandate of the works of mercy. Right. I, I think the temptation is that we become administrators of program rather than disciples of Christ, and we become bureaucrats rather than ministers of charity. And that is a, a, a very terrible temptation, uh, however well-intentioned. And one of the things I like about your book, as I said, is um, it's Christocentric, and it never loses its higher frame of reference. Friends, we come back. We're going to continue our conversation with Father Jeffrey Kirby. He's pastor of Our Lady of Grace Parish in Indian Land, South Carolina, adjunct professor of theology uh, at Belmont Abbey College. We're talking about telling truth in a culture of lies. Check out his book called Sanctify Them in Truth, how the church's social doctrine addresses the issues of our time. The next segment, we're going to talk about the most controversial issue. One might even call it the preeminent issue, the issue of abortion. Remember, our rallying cry here at the Catholic Current is Christus Mundo, Mundus Christo, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. We do it because our Lord says so for the greater glory of God, the love of our neighbor, and the salvation of our own soul. After the broadcast today, go to the station of the cross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. We'll be right back. Stay with us. This is Jesuit Father Robert McTigg, your daily host of The Catholic Current. Join me on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern to reconnect with journalist George Newmeyer. We'll be talking about abortion as the sacrament of the sexual revolution. Is that why they fight so hard for abortion? Hear it all on The Catholic Current on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, coming to you from the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. You're listening to The Catholic Current with Father Robert Mateig from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Stay connected with the show, our guests, and topics by following the show on Twitter and Gab. Just search for The Catholic Current. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us in the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. We're talking about defending truth in a culture of lies. My guest today is Father Jeffrey Kirby. We're using a, as a point of departure his new book called Sanctify Them in Truth, How the Church's Social Doctrine Addresses the Issues of Our Time. Uh, Father Kirby, in the United States, if you want to get the temperature in a room elevated immediately, you just have to mention abortion. We're all waiting with, with bated breath for the Supreme Court's decision on the Dobbs case, which could possibly uh, overturn the abortion mandate by repudiating Roe versus Wade. That's going to have uh, a lot of fallout. Uh, I know the bishops ha- have said in recent years that abortion is the preeminent moral issue. Uh, I have my own take on why they say that. I'm puzzled why some people push back against that. Why is it in in your book, just simply reflecting the teaching of the church, it's not an an innovation on your part, what is the link between abortion and preeminence? Yeah, so if we look at all of the life issues, which which we are called to address as Christians, so whether it's feeding the hungry or, or visiting those who are imprisoned or Uh, seeking justice for the downtrodden. Uh, We are called to do all of that. And, Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we have the spiritual works of mercy as well that we are also called to do. So if we look at all the life issues and all the social issues that we have an obligation to as Christians, 
abortion and euthanasia are the preeminent issues because we are dealing with life in its most vulnerable stage, Mm -hmm. specifically with abortion at the very beginning. So as our moral tradition would tell us, if we don't get abortion right, we have no moral foundation or credibility to argue anything on any life issue. How can I argue against war or torture or argue against poverty if I have not defended the dignity of human life from the very beginning? So in many respects, it is both chronologically, theologically, uh, sociologically, as <laughs> we keep going, it, it is right. a preeminent issue. Um, Pope St. John Paul II said it clearly, he said, the church must defend the, 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 the child in the womb uh, with maximum determination. That's the exact quote, maximum determination. And our tradition has always held uh, abortion and euthanasia to be preeminent issues. They are distinct and superior to all the other life issues and social issues that we are bound to and responsible for as Christians. Right. And, you know, what I was teaching medical ethics, I would say, look, we're only as safe as the most vulnerable member of our society. And if we can rationalize the deliberate taking of the life of any one innocent human person, then we can take we can rationalize the taking of life of any person uh, at all. And all other rights depend upon you being alive. If you don't have life, if you don't have life, then you don't have any rights to to exercise. So that's for me, it's absolutely clear that it has to be the preeminent issue. It's not meaningful to talk about it as anything other as the preeminent issue. And yet in the later part of your chapter, you talk about the seamless garment approach to morality. And it's been it's been communicated in a variety of forms and maybe hijacked by by some people. What is the, give us a a vanilla account of seamless garment and then talk about how it can be used against the preeminence of abortion. Yeah, so I'm so glad you asked about that, Father, and I I wanted to make sure I include that in the chapter. Uh, First, I I make the point that, you know, now when someone speaks of the seamless garment, you, you almost have to ask them to explain what they mean by the seamless garment because it has become an umbrella term for multiple different views in terms of moral theology. Mm-hmm. Uh, historically, and, and, and the seamless garment theory that can raise concerns is when every life issue and every social issue is seen on an equal plane. So everything is the same. So whether it's abortion or protests against war, or whether it's uh, you know, the desire for uh, you know, um, health care for, for, for uh, you know, the poverty stricken, and so on. So, so everything is equal. Well, it denies any type of hierarchy or essential difference in terms of the moral issues themselves. So let me give an example. In terms of immigration, there is an exercise of prudence. So it's Mm -hmm. possible that there could be multiple different valid, morally valid approaches to immigration because Mm -hmm. it requires prudence. So circumstances or intention can actually influence or change whether or not a view or a policy on immigration is good or not. And there can be multiple good uh, policies or laws for immigration. But when we deal with abortion and euthanasia, because they are are preeminent, they're they're distinct, um, there's a hierarchy, there's a recognized hierarchy because no circumstance, no intention can ever justify abortion and the taking of unborn life. So, we know that there's a hierarchy, and this is clearly taught by the church. It's seen in the scriptures. There's a hierarchy in terms of our life and social issues, but the seamless garment, at least in its historic form, denies all of that. And, and it falls into what we call in moral theology a proportionalism. Mm-hmm. So the idea that everything's on an equal standing, and you just weigh the pros and the cons. Right. And of course, that, that denies objective evil, and it denies the hierarchy within moral truth itself. The moral truth, for example, in our everyday lives, we see reflected in the distinction between mortal sin and venial sin, right? So the average Catholic can understand, oh yeah, yeah, there is this hierarchy, I understand that, right? Well, that's also true in terms of doctrine, there's a hierarchy. And the critical, uh, the um, seamless garment theory uh, denies that and falls in this type of proportionalism. Everything is, is in proportion. And well, you know what? 
if we get war right, you know, we're opposed to war and, and we're doing really great with poor poverty and, and, and we have health care under control and all these other things. Well, you know, then it's OK if children are being slaughtered in the womb. Right. So because proportionately, there's all this other good. So we really just have to focus on the good and rejoice in the good rather than, quote, obsessing about this other issue. And, and this is the basis for a lot of times the argument of you can't be a one issue voter. Um, you know, when it comes to a preeminent issue, uh, you have to allow it to be, remain a preeminent issue. Right. I mean, right. we would never say that the use of social policy by the National Socialists, the, the Nazis, in terms of the reform of education, the reforms of infrastructure, the reforms of employment, all of which were very successful. We would never say, no sane person would say, all these social developments are, are, are good enough where we could justify the genocide of one race. So the, the Holocaust towards the Jewish people. We would never say that. Right. But that same mentality, that same principle is being applied, this proportionalism, when we say, well, you can't be a one-issue person. You can't be a one-issue voter. You know, you, you can't just focus on this issue. You have to look at everything and weigh everything and so on. Well, you know, ultimately, it falls to the proportionalism. And the problem is you can justify any evil. And well, well, yeah, yes, evil. of course, because everything is only gray. Friends, we're talking today with Father Jeffrey Kirby. We're talking about his new book called Sanctify Them in Truth, How the Church's Social Doctrine Addresses the Issues of Our Time. I mean, the trouble with proportionalism, which for many years was the premier moral methodology in Catholic universities and seminaries, was there was no black or white. There was no intrinsic good or evil. There was only gray. And you should end up with more light gray according to your vision. Why you should... Uh, is 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 never made clear, and it becomes an excuse for everything. And for those who say, well, you know, if you add up all the other issues, then you know you can tolerate abortion up to a point. And I said, well, do you, have you reached a level of moral certitude that you have a maximum number of abortions before you say, no, we can't do this anymore? Is there a maximum number of uh, detected pregnancies that you're willing to abort? It's got to be less than 100%. It seems to me that very often this proportionalism is just a way of saying, I don't want to think about this, but I want to feel good about helping out at, at, at the soup kitchen. And, and, and we need to push back. Uh, another approach about uh, abortion is not only to relativize it, but to dismiss it in terms of absolute autonomy and self-determination. I mean, uh, Janet Yellen, who's uh, Secretary of Treasury, testified before the Senate Banking Committee, and she was explaining how in terms of economics, Roe versus Wade is helpful because children are expensive and they're time consuming. And sometimes it's really convenient to kill your own child. And in terms of absolute autonomy, an argument like that is unobjectionable. What's the Catholic response to the absolute view of uh, autonomy and self determination? Yeah, so oftentimes what we see in, in our fallen world is we take a good. So a good thing, a great gift that God has blessed us with, and we oftentimes manipulate it. Either we dismiss it or we exaggerate it. And when we speak about autonomy, uh, the, the word itself simply means self-will. And then autonomy can be properly understood as, as a self-possession. That, that mm -hmm. I know myself, I have a control possession of myself. Well, in a healthy way of life, and certainly in the Christian way of life, Self-autonomy is important. It's a gift given to us by God, so we can be distinct from those around us. But it's given to us so that we have something to give to another person, right? Mm -hmm. So, so my self-possession, my autonomy is given in order for it to be a self-donation. So mm -hmm. I possess myself in order to give myself. We we see this reflected within God Himself that. Each person of the Trinity is distinct and yet defined by relational terms because that distinctiveness is there in order to give, to love, to pour out oneself in, in service to, to another. And, and in a healthy way of life, a Christian way of life, certainly, uh, we have this autonomy in order to hold ourselves, to give ourselves. Well, if you take that gift and, and you radicalize it, you just exaggerate and take it to an extreme, well, the person becomes what the philosopher Charles Taylor calls the sovereign self, right? Yes. So everything is subordinate to the person. Marriage, family, 
work, social responsibilities, everything is subordinate. No, the person believes whatever they want is right. However they feel is right. And anyone who gets in their way is the problem and has to be destroyed. I mean, this is something that, you know, the philosopher uh, Nietzsche, who, who's a, the great anti-deist, uh, you know, that the God hater, uh, you know, right. he spoke about the will to power. Well, this even makes Nietzsche looks look tempered, you know, right. that, that this sovereign self that I am my own God in many respects. And, and this can even be used and create the culture that justifies the slaughter of the innocent, that a mother would kill her own child, that a medical doctor who is literally in a profession to do no harm could justify the taking a vulnerable life. The philosophy behind that, that the culture that supports that is radical autonomy. And, and that, that absolute uh, scope of will we're going to see in our next segment. Friends, we come back. We're going to continue to speaking with Father Jeffrey Kirby. We're talking about his new book called Sanctify Them in Truth, How the Church's Social Doctrine Addresses the Issue of Our Time. In the next segment, we're going to be talking about homosexuality and transgenderism. What does the wisdom of the church have to say? After the broadcast today, go to the thestationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Wherever you can find audio, you can find us. Follow us on your favorite platform, write a five-star review. We need to attract the attention of the algorithm so these conversations get the attention they deserve. Let's take this around the world. Back in two minutes. Stay with us. This is The Catholic Current from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Catch up on an episode you've missed or share them with your family or friends. The Catholic Current is podcasted wherever you enjoy listening. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. My guest today is Father Jeffrey Kirby. We're talking about his new book called Sanctify Them in Truth, How the Church's Social Doctrine Addresses the Issues of Our Time. Father, you know it's it's June uh, in the religious world, the Catholic world it's the month of the sacred heart in the secular world it's, it's the month of, of something else uh, homosexuality and transgenderism are, are really hot issues uh, and transgenderism I seems to be gaining a lot of momentum uh, secular news sources say it's the new premier civil rights issue of our mm. time uh, and I know a lot of parents who are confused by their kids who come home from school at a variety of ages and make certain announcements. And when we see that we're told, well, you know, we shouldn't be judging and every person has his own truth and we have to exercise pronoun hospitality and you don't want that child to commit suicide, do you? Uh, the stakes and the emotions seem to be very high. How can a Catholic reason through the issue uh, soberly yet compassionately? Yes, I think the, the first thing we can do you know, almost in looking at the chapters of of the book, of, of the book that I've written, is to go to that that third part of, of each chapter. And the third part uh, in this chapter, in terms of the LGBTQ plus movement, and and by the way, it's the largest chapter of the book because there are the most questions pertaining to this particular social issue. But if you go to that third part of the book, that that chapter of the book, it, it's the spiritual response. Because I think that you know, we go to the spiritual wisdom of St. Paul, who tells us we do not battle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a real spiritual crisis here that there is a total assault and, and clear revolt against reality. Right. So as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, the word truth is now considered bigoted, right? right. So first, I think we have to respond spiritually, that we have to pray and fast and seek grace and mercy and conversion in our lives and the lives of those around us, those who are involved in, in, in the social movement and so on, because, uh, you know, 
time we need to know truth, we have to be able to explain and, and, and have answers to the challenges that are posed against us. But my interaction with certain members of, of this movement is there is no reasoned discussion. So they'll make a point and an answer or response is given. And so this this raw appeal to emotion that or, or, or this kind of vehement, intolerant name calling, you know, right. um, and, and spiritually, we have to be ready for that. Because I'll tell you, even as a Catholic priest, as, as, as a, I've been Catholic my whole life, I was startled by the reaction. Wait, what? I, I, almost to the point of like, wait, I, I thought we were having a civil conversation. I, I thought this was a movement of tolerance and realized very quickly that for many people within that movement, uh, these are mere buzzwords that um, are not being lived out holistically. So I think we have to have our answers, our explanations. We have to, you know, of course, uh, kill with kindness, you know, uh, speak the truth in love. But I think also we have to prepare our hearts because I guess when you're dealing with a movement that revolts against reality, there is no reasoned discourse that should be expected. And I think spiritually we have to be ready for that so that we don't react uh, in frustration or anger, right, right. but that we preserve a spirit of peace and, and love. You know, I, I think you, you've put your finger on a very important point, Father, that um, this, this is not rational. You know, a, an adult person can't will himself into another sex. Uh, a, a person cannot drug or surgery himself into another sex. It's, it is simply not possible. Uh, and sometimes you have such a, uh, a rage against reality, such a rage against, but I want reality to bend to my will. You, you can't argue with that. It'd be like talk, trying to argue with someone about the anti-gravity movement. Uh, there's there's even a movement now called the Hearing Voices movements for people who have contact with non-consensual realities. Well, there used to be medication uh, for that. So I think sometimes the best we can do is the party involved can't be reasoned with. It's like Thomas Paine said, you can't reason with an irrational person any more than you can give medicine to a corpse. But we can have a conversation, a charitable, sober, sane conversation in public so that people who are confused but are not as emotionally invested can come to some sort of clarity uh, as well. Yes. What are your thoughts on that approach? Yes, very much. And, and, and your emphasis on those who are involved in this movement be you know that are confused or who come from brokenness or are looking for some type of acceptance or you know have this discomfort this disassociation with themselves and, and, and are somehow in this movement but aren't the leaders or the zealots in, in, in the movement but but are there and, and are really just trying to find answers or help and, and I think that's you know that's our hope that's the response we can have in terms of, of speaking truth and love. Uh, if I can recount a story that, that I actually put in uh, this chapter of the book. Um, some time ago, I was invited to my hometown uh, for an, uh, a public event, and, and afterwards there was this uh, you know, buffet reception and so on. I'm sitting there at the buffet, and, and two women approach me. I, I'd seen them throughout the event. Uh, because of their public display of their affection, I, I assumed that they were lesbians. Um, so I'm standing there at the buffet table, my Roman collar, they approach me and they immediately confrontational uh, and say, you, you think we're wrong. You think we're wrong. You know, I was a little caught off guard and I smiled. I said, I do think you're wrong. And you could just see the, re you know, the, the reaction like, whoa, you know, I said, I do think you're wrong. And I pointed to their plate. I said, the food you've chosen, there's better food on this buffet. <laughs> you, know? you, you have not been good. Right. And, um, and they had to laugh in spite of themselves. And so they kind of laughed and they said, well, you, you, know, you, you think we're wrong. What do you see when you see us? I said, that's a great question. And I said to them, I said, I'll tell you, the first thing I see are two children of God, well-beloved, who want companionship, who want someone to walk through life with, to love and be loved by, to share the joys and the struggles of life with. That's the first thing I see, right? Well, they were completely disarmed. Sure. You <laughs> and, don't sound like a hater like, when you say that. Exactly, exactly. And and this is what St. Paul tells us about speaking the truth in love. And, and 
And honestly, Father, that, this is why I've written this book, to, to help us with these answers so we can have that peace and that calm and, and, and not sound like haters or in spite of ourselves, actually be haters. <laughs> you know, right. like, and, and so the conversation went on that day. I said, well, you think we're wrong. He, you know, I said, well, I will say this, like the way you express yourself sexually, we definitely disagree on. Mm-hmm. I said, but I understand something greater between us. And I can understand the desire for companionship. Well, I went down, I went and sat down at a table and, and, and they followed me and I'm sitting at my table. We ended up having this great conversation. I, I just had to laugh because I thought other people looking at this would see, you know, oh, there, there's the Catholic priest and the, and the two lesbians, <laughs> you know, right? right yeah. Like, yeah. You know, laughing and, and, and joking and so on. And, and I just tell that story because for the, poor, the members of that movement who have legitimate tolerance and, and openness, uh, we have a great avenue and opportunity there. Mm-hmm. And, and when we have moral truth, we can't betray our command to love others because of our focus on this truth. We have to put the truth and love together and speak that truth in love. And then St. Paul tells us love is patient and kind. It's not rude. You know, so that's the part where I think by having a comfortability with the truth, we can be those witnesses that we're called to be to others. Friends, we're speaking today with Father Jeffrey Kirby. We're talking about his new book called Sanctify Them in Truth, How the Church's Social Doctrine Addresses the Issues of Our Time. Reminds me when I was a new priest and I was at a wedding reception and everyone was up and dancing and I was at the table by myself and a young woman sat down next to me and she said, well, Father, I've been married for three years and I've been on the pill all that time. I'm going to start another package of pills this evening unless you have something to say to me. And we talked for an hour and she threw away her pills and she asked me to hear her confession. So I told the seminarians I was teaching and I said, now how did that happen? I said, well, first of all, I paid attention in class so I knew what the church taught and why. And then on my own, I went to the library so that this humanities major could understand the science of contraception. And third, I prayed to get ready uh, to meet someone like that with both compassion and truth. And I think the moral of the story there is this, that we owe people the truth. And because we're not machines, sometimes the truth is hard. And so we have to be able to tell the truth lovingly and persuasively. And it has to be done with a spirit of charity because we're all sinners and, and we're all confused at some point or another. Father, how, how about the issue of of homosexuality. Uh, I mean, I don't know what new frontiers are left for that, uh, Mm. for that movement. And you're considered absolutely hateful if you say out loud what the church has always taught. Uh, For people who want to teach their children the right thing, but are confused of how to proceed, what would you recommend? I I would focus on the principle of complementarity in our tradition. So to highlight the beauty of femininity and masculinity and the, the beautiful complementarity that, that, that that dynamism that exists between men and women, not only physically, but, you know, spiritually, emotionally, you know, there's this beauty of man and woman distinct and yet called together. And I think by focusing on that, uh, it allows, you know, the, the young people, especially to begin to understand that the beauty of their respective gender to understand that the beauty of this complementarity that you know their young minds is is seen in terms of relationality, in terms of of emotions and spirituality, and then later the sexual aspect becomes a part of that. And they have already been formed to understand, to appreciate, to cherish, you know, this distinctiveness between man and woman and, and that beautiful complementarity. So, I think that's the key, especially in forming uh, young minds to understand uh, the beauty. Of our of our gender, and then you know this you know the height of the love, uh, which um, between man and woman becomes a sexual expression. So I think that's that's the real part that we have to retrieve and emphasize. And, and again, uh, in in family life, uh, you know, divorce has, has hurt this, but in family life, in the Christian family, like if there's a husband and wife, like children see that. So in many respects, it can just be making it intentional, explaining, you know, this beauty, this complementarity between the two. So I think that's a major, a huge principle that we have to uh, retrieve in terms of, of you know, pre- creating the culture and, and, and the foundation in which when homosexuality is addressed, it already has 
that's your foundation, that, 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 again, culture that allows for an answer to be given. Well, I, I, and I agree with you, Father. I also want to add that I think that we're going to be facing an uphill battle for a long time. And I say it for, for this reason, that once you separate uh, sexuality from fertility and marriage in the beginning of children, then there are no intrinsic natural limits to, to sexual ethics at all. And if we get back to complementarity, fertility, marriage, family, then you've got to touch that, that hot button issue of contraception. And if you want to get people indignant and outraged in a hurry, whether they're Catholic or not, you've got to ask them to rethink uh, contraception, uh, which is not only unhealthy, but a violation of human dignity and also a violation of, of God's law. You now that would take us in, into a very different field for another couple, two, three, four hours. Uh, friends, we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Father Jeffrey Kirby. He's adjunct professor of theology at Belmont Abbey College. We're talking about his new book called Sanctify Them in Truth, How the Church's Social Doctrine Addresses the Issues of Our Time. In the next segment, we're going to talk about next steps. Once you see how beautiful the church's social teaching is and how it all fits together, what do you do? Be part of the conversation. Follow what we're following by following us on Gab. That's G-A-B dot com. Our channel is The Catholic Current. After the broadcast today, go to the station of the cross dot com. Get our resources list. Download our audio as podcast. Everything you need to take this conversation to your family and friends we give to you. Together, let's take it around the world. Back in just two minutes. Please do stay with us. Being tempted isn't a sin. Hebrews 4 verse 15 says that Christ was tempted in all ways that we are yet without sin. So if I'm being tempted, and then in a certain sense, I'm in good company. I'm in the company of our Lord, in the company of Jesus. But what he wants me to do is actually resist. Resist those temptations as he did during his life. That's Sermons for Everyday Living weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. After today's broadcast, go to the Catholic Current Show page on thestationofthecross.com for info on today's guests, the show resource links, and to sign up for our weekly email of upcoming shows. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. My guest today is Father Jeffrey Kirby. He's a pastor. He's adjunct professor of theology at Belmont Abbey College. We're talking about his new book called Sanctify Them in Truth, How the Church's Social Doctrine Addresses the Issues of Our Time. Uh, Father, you, you end your uh, book with a story similar to something that happened to me one of the first time I was teaching ethics. And at the end of the last lecture, a student said, well, I'm really angry. I said, why is that? He said, because all this makes so much sense and nobody told me. Uh, likewise, you know, you talk about speaking with a gentleman who hearing the church's teaching saying, they're so consistent, all the teachings flow, they all work together. You know, almost as if there was an intelligent design behind it all. <laughs> Why are people so surprised by that, that the Catholic faith makes so much sense? Yes, I think it, it, it's the tragic consequences of, of secularism that convinces people that faith is not rational, that it's superstition, it, it's the denial of our reason rather than the elevation of our reason. So I think our culture has very much, since the Enlightenment on, has had this full-time assault on faith to strip it of its credibility, of its ability to contribute to discourse and reason thought, and, and ultimately the changing of hearts. So I, I think culturally we have a huge battle in, in terms of making the argument that revealed truth can contribute and has credibility. And then specifically, I think, within the household of faith, a lot of priests and teachers of the faith don't go back and provide the context or the formation 
in order to form and help Christians to think as people of goodwill, as believers, as people who acknowledge absolute truth. And a lot of times uh, priests will not address social issues uh, from the pulpit, or if they do, uh, regrettably, their language is very politically charged, right. rather right. than drawing from our moral tradition and presenting the reasonability and the arguments from the faith, from the gospel, uh, from, from our theological tradition. So I think both culturally and then within the church, uh, we have some major hurdles uh, still to jump. Right. I, very often, and I'm sure you've seen this too, Father, talking with someone who's dissenting from what the church teaches, almost certainly can't give an accurate account what the church actually teaches, and even more certain, can't give an accurate account of why the church teaches what it does. So, so people have either impressions where they've misheard things, uh, or they're looking for excuses for, for, for bad behavior. Uh, but it seems to me that the, uh, the church's social teaching is good news. It's a way of living our human dignity very well. It's also true that we're fallen, and we live in with all fallen human beings. So I think the the real issue is to live this beautiful truth, you have to be converted to Christ, and that always involves a cross, doesn't it? Because we're sinners. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think that you know just acknowledging that true peace is a tranquility of order. So to understand how things fit together, human dignity, human rights and responsibilities and so on, that when these all these different parts come together, then there is authentic peace. And, and the desire that we have for peace as human beings made in God's image uh, should compel us to both seek and then to accept and then to begin to integrate these truths that are given to us, these truths that find their expression, their, their almost incarnation in these social issues, as we begin to realize, oh, when we speak about human dignity, that's what it looks like. Oh, we speak about my social responsibility, is that that's what it means. And suddenly all the different pieces come together. But if we allow ourselves to live fragmented existences, right, so pieces of us are all over the place, then we can never really see the consistency of truth because we really haven't seen the consistency in ourselves. So I'm reminded years ago, an older priest said to me, you know, we say to the world, uh, God loves you. And we know exactly what that means, but we say it to the unbeliever, to the secular person, and we think that they know what it means. But we have to realize that they don't know God, love, or even themselves. Mm -hmm. So an except, a simple expression, God loves you, that means nothing. They have no context because of the fragmentation that's happened, right. that even one's identity is all over the place. Right. There, there is, um, there, there's, there's an inconsistency. I mean, they have a vague sense of, uh, of good and evil in terms of, I like this and I don't like that. And they have an odd sense of what it means to be a, a human being, that somehow it's a bundle of emotions driven by will that's stuck in a body. And then they have this view of ultimate reality that's kind of this vague, it's it's physics and it, and it's New Age ghostism and, and, and Gnosticism. Yeah. So of course they're confused and they can't, they, they don't know how to receive the coherent and liberating truth that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ of God and he is the way, the truth, and the life. Father, I'm sure you've heard the use of the phrase, the pastoral approach. Priest said, well, I took the pastoral <laughs> approach, which usually means I didn't tell them the truth. My take is this, right. the pastoral approach is to tell people the truth and then give them the natural and supernatural helps and Christian fellowship to live the truth, which is often hard. What are your thoughts on that? Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm so glad you're highlighting this, Father, because we do hear that a lot. And, and it's used to justify evil or sins of omission from, from the shepherds of the church. Uh, the greatest love we can do, the highest expression of love, is to tell the truth. And then other acts of love flow from that. But, but to deny the truth or to purposely just, you know, not disclose the truth uh, to someone who's sincerely asking or wants to know or needs to know uh, is a grave violation of charity, especially by a shepherd of the church who has been formed, ordained, and sent to proclaim the good news, to, to speak truth. So I think people who try to 
anyone, whether they're ordained ministers or they are involved in church work in some capacity, anyone who tries to circumvent the clear teachings of the church and to claim a pastoral approach, uh, in my opinion, is, is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, they, they are manipulating the gospel. Um, it's interesting in, in St. Paul's letters and the Catholic letters of the New Testament, uh, two things are most denounced, division and false teachers. And, and you know, the early apostles tell the Christian disciples, like, flee from the false teachers. Do not follow them. Right. And I think someone who's not going to tell the truth, especially someone who's been given a position or responsibility to tell the truth and to claim some type of pastoral you know, uh, compromise or, or pastoral uh, you know, exception, um, it, again, it, is, it violates charity and it betrays the integrity of the responsibility they've been given. And, you know, as as ordained ministers of the gospel, I mean, we receive the commission to preach the gospel. The book of the gospel is put in our hands by the bishops, and we're told, receive the gospels of Christ, whose herald you now are. Believe what you read, teach what you believe, and practice what you teach. So if you and I, as ordained priests, are not immersing ourselves in the word, if we're not impaling ourselves on the word like that two-edged sword so that uh, what is worthy and unworthy can can be revealed and separated. If we're not absolutely committed to doing that, we're not going to be the agents of good for the sheep entrusted to our care. And I'm really confident that the chief shepherd is watching and is going to have a conversation with you and with me about how well we did or did not feed his sheep with the truth. Father Jeffrey Kirby of Belmont Abbey College, God bless you for your your good work. I hope we can have another conversation in the future. Likewise. Thank you, Father. I'm Jesuit Father Robert McTagg, your host here every day at the Catholic Current. Join us tomorrow for Timely Tuesday. We're going to welcome back author and journalist George Newmeyer. We're going to be talking about abortion and the sexual revolution. You don't want to miss that. After the broadcast today, go to the stationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Through the intercession of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace and please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the station of the cross.com, a listener funded nonprofit organization. Please prayerfully consider donating at the station of the cross.com by calling 1 877 888 6279 or through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app.